Welcome back, it's Podcast with a K. We're back from a summer break, and uh, there's loads of stuff going on that I would like to tell you about, and I'm not going to tell you about just now. This is Christian Corning, and I'm joined this week by Gareth Gavanna. I will tell you, however, that Gareth and I have just talked about maybe recording some more in the near future, and I've also arranged some podcast recording time with a gentleman called Brian Terranova. So that will be fun when that happens uh, in October. Uh, Gareth, how are you? Tell them about your greenhouse. I thought you were going to tell them all about your greenhouse then. <laughs> <laughs> you were just telling me about it. I was very excited. None of this. You didn't tell me about any of this. The, the greenhouse. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think the greenhouse is that interesting at the moment. Very interesting. Never <laughs> underestimate the power of a greenhouse to entrance and, and amaze in conversation. The, the Castorbus Towers greenhouse. Yes, your green cathedral. <laughs> I could play all day. Uh, Gareth, what have you been up to, mate? You've been to Edinburgh and oh, everywhere. I have. Got, you know, we went to Edinburgh last month and that <clears throat> for the fringe, and that feels like about a thousand years ago now. Feels like it never happened. Um, but yeah, we went up there with our Douglas Adams play. We apologise. And sitcom stories as well that was and it was great so we spent a week up there performing pitching punting seeing other stuff um yeah amazing uh really got some as, good reviews as well we got some lovely reviews um i think the thing with ours is that's satisfying is the the adams fans they they get it they know it they love it um, but we're actually getting people who don't necessarily know who Douglas Adams was so much who just are enjoying it as a piece. So really good. Um, the idea is to go back next year with it again as it's our 42nd anniversary. Uh, what well, hours? It's it's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I yeah. must I must mention at this point, dear listener. I only woke up 10 minutes ago, so mm. I'm just starting on my first cup of tea. So the mighty engine is not quite up to speed yet. They will be. Um, yes, the Mighty Engine back. sounds like it should have been a, a, a retro video game. But do continue, sorry. Well, no, the Mighty Engine is a quote from, um, that's Gene Hunt, always says, you know, ah. he needs to start the Mighty Engine. And it's usually either with a pint or a cup of tea. Yes. So it's a bit early for a pint. So a cup of tea will do the job. Um, yeah, so we, we, and we're going back next year with, we apologise. And with a brand new play um, about Dennis Potter, which should be a treat. And hopefully with a second set of sitcom stories. So you'll see even more of us in Edinburgh next year. So, uh, yeah, it'll be quite, good. Yeah, that's quite good. I, um, in I, between there, there was... that, yeah I've, been, yeah, I've been fixing arcade machines for yes. what seems like forever. In my cave, um, surrounded by androids and nutrition and, you know, all of that, all of the good fun. But yeah, that, that's been me. What about you? What about you? Ah, uh, well, um, actually, there was a, there was a day where I thought we might actually come up to Edinburgh and uh, grab one of your showings, actually. Oh, that... Um, but that didn't transpire. We did something else instead. Oh. Um, generally speaking, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's lots of then. <laughs> lots of days out really during the summer, basically. Lots of interesting places I've been to before. Nice um, place down near York that was in uh, sort of country house. Can't remember the name of it at the moment. And was an air base during the war because it was a, well, it wasn't an air base. It was used by the RAF. The actual base was like a mile away. Um, places like that. Been over to Windermere. Uh, I went on a comedy script writing workshop event last Saturday. Hey, you kept that quiet, you sly dog. With um, uh, Bennett Aaron. I don't was, know. Uh, running that. Uh, he's a TV. He's, he's done bits for Have I Got News For You and shows like that, okay. Mock the Week and okay. uh, other things. I, he's in something on the radio at the moment that uh, Angus Steedon's in as well. Uh, but I can't remember what that's called. Uh, so that was good. Quite. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't keep it quiet. I just didn't tell anyone I was going. Well, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have those conversations where you never ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It didn't come up. Are you going to any comedy writing sh- workshops lately? No, not really. It didn't, yeah, no one asks you, do they? So. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well then, he's, he's, yeah. a, he's a good writer, listener, on the slide. Keeps it quiet. Yeah, possibly. 
yeah, so yeah, we've been doing a bit of that. Um, yeah, just uh, just a general summer, really, I think. Yeah, uh, sort of sum- summerish, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of all vanished now. Um, and you know, this is supposed to be Doctor Who time, isn't it? I mean, it's it about is. The- there isn't any. Years ago that Destiny of the Daleks was on, and I was just that's where it all changed. Yeah, that wow. was the most exciting thing I think I'd ever seen at that point. Yeah, I remember Destiny of the Daleks going out, but um, I remember being Daleks, and they were the first time I'd seen Daleks. Mm. I remember very little else apart um, of it, other than that. My um, my starker memories from Doctor Who come the following season. So, um, yeah, the 1979 run doesn't really... Oh, poor this. you. Well, earliest yeah. memories of the uh, of men in curtains giving lofty speeches. Oh, dear. Surprised you stayed with it. We, we should be doing a Buck Rogers podcast at this moment. <laughs> well, no, my earliest the memory memories? is from... My earliest memory is t- uh, key, key to Time, my very earliest memory. I know mm. because I remember the... Um, I remember when I first watched it off UK Gold back in about 93, 94, um, I sat there watching thing. I've seen this. I've seen yeah. this. I don't remember this. I've seen this. I know I've seen this. You know that you have that feeling of recognition. And you, oh, do, yeah. you don't know what's going to happen next. You have that intense feeling of recognition and it, it feels all comfortable and familiar and that without actually knowing what's going to happen next. So, yeah, keep the time. I definitely remember, at the very least, the Pirate Planet. Well, my earliest memory is probably The Deadly Assassin. Um, wow. I've been watching Doctor Who before that. But it's only a sort of... The things I remember are the Master's horrible burnt face and then vivid fried egg eyes. <clears throat> that very well. I remember uh, the whole look and feel of Gallifrey and, um, and, and the Dreamscape episode. I remember that very well. I don't remember the ending at all. Um, it's just little moments and um, an old... Castellan Spandrel being, or whatever his name, not Spandrel, it's, um, uh, yeah, it, it's whoever's I mean, stuff yeah, the yeah, film yeah. can, it's the guard, I think. So, I remember all that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then after that, I, I certainly remember the first Leela one very well. Although, you never know if you remember them better, because I think Robots of Death was repeated, so you remember that one, remember that right. one very well. And the same with the key to time, because they repeated the um, Pirate Planet, so I definitely remember that well. Um, good times. Good times. And yeah, it's funny how those little moments kind of sear in. And you yeah. don't know if it's true or if you're re-remembering them or if you're actually exactly. remembering reading the Target book and then remembering what it was like. But no, I definitely remember the, the Master's crispy face. So I, what do you... Um... How, yeah. how old were you? How old were you then in '76 when Deadly Assassin went out? Were you three? Assassin, I would have been three or four. Yeah, so, no, I would. I, I was around three when uh, Pirate Planet went out. Ah, uh, lovely. Mm, yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, but obviously my parents let me watch it. Although I suspect they were too busy running the hotel, so I didn't know. <laughs> what was. That was great. Every now and again, my mother would try and say, oh, no, you shouldn't be watching this. And I'd obviously blow such a tantrum that they'd decide it was easier just to let me watch it. You know, there's a, there's, there's a group of people of a certain age who, who spent years thinking that particular shows were in colour and other shows were in black and white. Mm-hmm. So for me, Doctor Who was always in colour. Return of the Saint was always in black and white, and I didn't know it was in colour until a... Um, a, a, a well-known Doctor Who illustrator named Anthony Dry gave me the DVD to Return of the Saint. I'd never seen yeah. it in colour. You watched it at your dams and she only had a black and white belly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, most people will have watched the Pertwee era in black and white. That's the yeah. difficulty of them going to all this effort of restoring it into, you know, into exquisite <laughs> colour. Um, is that most people's experience would have been as black and white. Yeah, and, and a lot of the special effects work look far better in black and white, of course. Well, they do. It's one of the things I'm finding with these new Blu-rays, like Planet of the Daleks was a classic example. How unkind this sort of upscaling to um, broadcast master quality really is, you know, because the people making it, if they were t- taping things down, 
and really just doing a quick coat of paint as opposed to a loving three or four coats on your console, it looks dreadful. It looks really dreadful on our modern tellies. But mm. on that uh, 19 inch, 21 inch black and white set, even a color set, it would have looked absolutely fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the old, the old black and white TV with a yeah. dial on it, just trying to yeah. get it tuned in to get that perfect picture, which you never can get. So there's always a little bit of interference there while you're watching it. Oh, always. I've also realised that the past was a very dusty place looking at these old Blu-rays. <laughs> the amount of dust in the TARDIS in particular is, is, is extremely impressive. Pop it, you have a look at the top of the time rotor. It's usually nice. thick. <laughs> well, has it come out first his hair? Well, you do wonder. But they're lucky no one put a little smiley face in the dust. You know, like, like I always do. You know. Or, you know, if you think my TARDIS is... You know, you know oh, well, I'm not going to say it. There's some of the things you see on the back of the trucks, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of if you think my TARDIS off. is bad, you should see my girlfriend's Vortex. That's the one I was thinking of, but... You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's um. So I suppose this is the problem that Doctor Who was never meant to be ingested in such high res, loving, um, obsessive manner. It was literally supposed to be, as the mighty Terence Dick said. Although he was always a bit disingenuous there with his, it was supposed to be something that stopped them putting the test card on for half an hour. I like to think that their ambition was a bit higher, but not much. Well, I don't think Doctor Who was meant to be ingested at all, was it? Um, certainly not in his pre-2005 incarnation. It was just there to watch. Well, it should, was, like, um, the whole ingestion of things as a, you know, as a part of the marketing, as part of the actual production, that's very, very much a more recent... Uh, well, I don't know, you see. I blame Terence and his wretched target book. That's where it all starts. Because suddenly you have your own copy of the show to obsessively read whenever you fancy. Mm. And... And Terence quite conveniently fixes some of the plot bits that don't quite work. You know, he stretches this, he elongates that. He gives them a nice opening. Very fond of a coda. You know, so, yeah, this is Terence's fault. Now, um, I'm going to push this onto a different subject. Which you might be able uh-huh. to help me out with, okay? You'll certainly, you'll, you'll certainly have something to say on this. So, so we, um, during the summer, I took... Uh, my eldest children, twins, to see the Horrible Histories movie. Oh, yeah. Which is surprisingly good, because it's not the first movie that's come from that stable. There was a story a couple of years ago about uh, William Shakespeare, which wasn't so funny. The Horrible Histories movie is very funny. It's got a good cast. Um, and it's about the Romans, if you don't know about this. Uh, it's about the Romans. And um, Bruce, my son, was um, asking me various things about the Romans and then asked me if there's any Roman Doctor Who. And I was thinking, well, there's the Romans, um, there's, there's, there's Rory, there's that whole thing there. And then the Iron Legion jumped into my head, which I haven't read uh, in ages. Yeah. And I described the Iron Legion to him and he was absolutely gobsmacked. Yeah. Iron Legion is wonderful. Um, do you know, isn't there surprisingly little Roman stuff in Doctor Who when you actually think about it? Mm, yeah, there is. And it never occurred to me until you said that. You mean there is the Romans? Everyone goes, oh yes, that's good fun. And then nothing until Rory. So that, God, I mean, that's nearly 50 years later. Someone goes, or 45 years later, oh yeah, we haven't done the Romans for a while. That's crazy, isn't it? You've got all those costumes, all those great storytelling. Oh, and there's the light at the end as well. Isn't that the Romans? Or I was going the to, Eater I, I, of Light, the Rona Monroe one. Yes, there is. There is that one. And there's obviously um, the Pompeii one, which is Romans, but it's Rome. So it's a little oh, bit. God, yeah. It's still Rome, and it's but, still okay, Romans. So but you always think of the Romans as they've invaded Britain or whatever. Yeah. Time. You know, I would have thought that you could have done, oh, well, I suppose there's the Romans in the war games as well. Oh, now they're tumbling out the cupboard, the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, there's those Romans in Day of the Daleks as well. No, 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 no. No, 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 I don't remember. Um, and of course, the, yeah, there's the Iron Legion, which, gosh, is, that's going to be 40 years old in about two weeks' time. 
Wow, really? You know, why do you know that fact so well? Well, because as publisher of Warp Warp, all of these key dates are seared <laughs> into me. Um, but as much as anything, I remember how thrilling it was. Um, buying that first issue of Doctor Who Weekly. Well, I didn't. I had it bought for me. So I was. I would have just gone. I would have been seven. It was about the time of my seventh birthday, and um, my nan bought me that. Twelve pence of pure pleasure. Um, and it, it is no mistake to say that is the issue that changed everything. Um, Des skin, what he puts together, the skills, the talent, his mix of stuff. He, he grabs hold of Doctor Who and he makes a couple of very important decisions. The first is he's not going to do anything about contemporary Doctor Who, which is curious when you think about it. He's only going to do the past. He's going to celebrate the... He's going to have a strip, a backup strip, letters page, a letter from the Doctor, um, and features on the monsters and the show. And that's it. Oh, plus transfers. Lots of transfers. A mm. lot of publication. Still stands... Um, so I think DWM are doing a big celebration in their next issue. Um, a DVD, a special DVD full of treats, a special... Oh. Supper- um, I can't wait to read it. We haven't been involved in it in any way, and I'm quite pleased because it means I get to all. It's, it's like when we drop a Doctor Who, an issue of, Do- of Warp, Warp Off at Doctor Who magazine, they, they're they always kind enough to say, This is wonderful. This is like having an issue of Doctor Who magazine we haven't had to work on. Um, and so for us, this is like us having an issue of Warp Warp that we haven't had to work on. So I'm pretty yeah, yeah. happy. Um, but yeah, Iron Legion, wonderful. Good old Pat Mills pitched it to the BBC in 1977-78 and I think I've seen an outline, I remember Des Skin showed me an outline, like a, a plot outline for the Doctor and Leela um, so it must be sort of it's probably that sort of season 15 1978-ish I seem to remember it, it worked quite nicely so I think you could have probably filmed it on a BBC budget it would, it would be very be. different wouldn't it, a completely different scale it would be different, but all the, the guts of it. So I could imagine, I could imagine the opening with uh, robot legionnaires in a little sleepy village. Um, yeah, Rome would perhaps quite not, not look as grand. It it would be a combination of a corner of television centre plus maybe just maybe some location filming in the British Museum or somewhere with lots of columns. Um, Things like the Colosseum would be a challenge. Things like, but I think you would just do a different version. But the guts of it, all those um, imperial throne room scenes with the Emperor and Ironica, they would all be the same. The slave mm. revolution would be the same. Um, it would just be different. Yeah, I, I would like to have seen that. But I can see why they turned it down. You know, if we're if we're saying Underworld was a bit ambitious and a little bit flat, you know, <clears throat> uh, Legion would perhaps be beyond. No, no comparison, nothing to see here. No, yeah, you're right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It is a, a visually stunning. Thanks to um, Dave Gibbons, not the, the the idea is just um, the, whole, the whole concept behind it's just really, really the, what you want in a comic. Basically, isn't it? It's it's like that. That's it's a combination of all. That. You know, Pat Mills. Pat did an awful. I remember again. Des had loads of these in his filing cabinet at some point. I remember him seeing um, the detailed script and and essentially mood boards that that Pat would send in. You know, he he didn't just write the script and it be very detailed. He had lots and lots of research and papers. Incredible work went into this script. Um, and he would cut out things from like the Sunday supplement magazines and say, I want it to look like this and I want a ballast day and I want the shopkeeper. I remember seeing a thing where the shopkeeper in the first one looked a bit like like someone out of Dickens novel. He actually cut out a picture of that shopkeeper from a Sunday supplement and said, that's what I want that shopkeeper to look like. Dave Gibbons is, of course, perfect for the strip because Dave has... Um, an industrial design background. So everything in there looks solid and believable and credible. So, you know, the, the Legionnaires look real. They look 
the the technology looks real. You know, Aronicus looks grand and imperious, but also deadly. It's it, it's a fantastic piece of work all round. Um, is it the greatest Doctor Who ship ever made? Possibly, actually. There might be grander ones that come after it. There might be ones that have that tug at our heartstrings in different ways. But without the Iron Legion, you got nothing. Before the Iron Legion, it's mostly TV comic path with a little bit of Jerry Haylock goodness. But let's be frank, most people's my experience of a Doctor Who comic strip at that time had been if I was unfortunate enough to be bought TV comic and you go, Ugh. Hmm. or some of those bizarre strips that you got in the Doctor Who annual. Which I've learned to enjoy. Um, they have a charm as you get older. But let's be frank, it isn't the Iron. The first true Doctor Who comic strip is the Iron Legion for me. So that's why it's most important. So yeah. I hope you'll have enjoyed it. If you got yeah, that, well, he had, well, I haven't got it out of storage yet. He, we, uh, we'll be looking at it soon. He's in the middle of an Alec Rider, Alex Rider at the moment. But um, yeah, this is yeah. Uh, next on the list. He'll enjoy that. He also gets Tom Baker. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I say what's clever, Tom Baker's obsession with getting to Benidorm in those early strips. <laughs> just at the time, no, 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 stick with me. Just at the time that that modern British families were starting to go a, a, abroad on their holidays, yeah. Instead of going to Bali for a week, they were going let's go to Benidorm or horribly. So the fact the Doctor wanted to go to these places, and as you know. I've always wanted to see a story where the Doctor arrives in 70s Benidorm. It is aching to be written. Someone out there clever will do it for me. With the sea devils rising from the sea. That would be Ooh, nice. What, what better? What better? So, yeah, that is uh, Doctor Who and the Iron Legion, which is, um, I believe it's still available. Um, I haven't seen it for a while on bookshelves, but you'll be able to pick it up on eBay or Amazon oh, if you... It, to be brought out endlessly every few years. I think IDW did a um, a deluxe sort of colorized version, version. Yeah. and um, and then there's the original um, Panini version. There's Lord knows how many compilations of it in the 80s. I suppose it's like Genesis of the Daleks. There's a reason it keeps getting repeated. It's so good. Yeah. So that's the Iron Legion. Um. And I think that probably brings us to the end of this podcast with a K. Um, as noted earlier, we will be back with some more shows for you in the coming weeks and months. We're probably going to be working on a sort of fortnightly, three-weekly basis. There's other stuff going on as well, which I really want to talk to you about. Um, sadly, I can't tell you at the moment, because if I don't do it, then I will look ridiculous. Um, but until uh, next time, uh, from Gareth and myself, it's goodbye. Bonjour. This is a Beyond Casterbers podcast. Available on iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher.com, Player FM, and BeyondCasterbers.com. Beyond